Welcome to uh, Texas First, I guess, and welcome to Northside uh, School District. We are uh, so pleased to have you here. On behalf of the Texans in the room, we'll apologize for the weather. We usually do much better than this in November, so uh, sorry that we couldn't deliver on something a little nicer. I think the sun will come out uh, before you leave San Antonio, though. Uh, again, welcome. We're uh, really pleased to have you uh, here. What I thought I'd do is do a very poor man's version of the, of the keynote that you were probably going to receive this morning and talk a little bit about uh, facilities as we think about it in our school district. So uh, in Northside is a fairly large uh, school district by geography. We're, we're about 355 square miles. We make up the kind of northwest quarter of Bear County, which is the county in which San Antonio is located. And then we lap into a couple of other rural counties uh, as well. We serve about 106,000 students in about 120 schools, and those schools range from being built in the 1950s to being finished in August of this year, uh, and every shade of gray uh, in between. So we have both the new facilities construction issues as well as significant maintenance issues on our older buildings, and I'll talk a, a little bit about uh, that. There were about three decades from the 70s until the early 2000s that we grew uh, between 2,500 and 3,000 students a year. So we got in the habit of just essentially building enough classrooms to get enough desks for the kids, right? That was our goal with regard to uh, our facilities programming uh, and our bond issues. That has changed uh, over the last several years, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's changed. Some of you may be experiencing similar things. Uh, and now we're able to focus much more of our facilities construction dollars on renovation to those buildings built in the 50s and the 60s, which I know is, uh, I'm sure, for some of you, uh, an issue uh, as well. Since 1995, we have literally passed a bond issue about every three years. Uh, we recently, uh, in May, uh, passed a bond issue around $850 million. Uh, That's the biggest one that we've ever uh, had, and it will do a little bit of new school construction and a whole lot, as I said, uh, of renovation. Uh, in that period of time, our patrons have supported uh, nearly $2 billion uh, in bond authorizations for our school district. We're very fortunate in our district to uh, have a very supportive community who understands growth and understands the needs for new schools to accommodate that growth. Uh, having a conversation with the community when growth is slowing uh, is a very different, uh, very different conversation. Again, I'll, I'll touch on that uh, here uh, in a second. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to get into today are some of the challenges uh, that we see with regard to uh, facilities and facilities construction and maintenance uh, in our district. And one of the things that I'll hit on is the uh, changing landscape with regard to choice. Uh, and I suspect that this is not just a Texas thing, although this is acutely true uh, in the state of Texas. Families have lots of options on how to educate their kids these days. I think when most of us went to high school or went to school, there were essentially two options. You went to the neighborhood school, or if your parents could afford it and were so inclined, they sent you to a private or parochial uh, school. When, when I grew up, there was no question about where you were going to school. You were going to the one right down at the end of the street, right? All of us went. That was just the way that we thought about school. That is obviously no longer the case, right? Folks have lots of choices from never leaving the home in a homeschool or an online school environment to a charter school environment or, or certainly private parochial schools uh, and obviously our public schools. What we see here uh, in Bear County is a massive uh, explosion in the charter school market. Um, charter school seats um, in our uh, county have increased by 180% in the last five years, while the, while the, the K-12 population has increased by a little less than 5%. So we're running essentially dual systems uh, of public schooling. In Texas, charter schools are publicly funded, as are uh, independent school districts, and we're running essentially dual systems of, it, of public schooling uh, in our state. Um, it has been very interesting, to be as kind as I possibly can be, uh, about our planning, right? In Texas, uh, charter schools do not have to announce other than in a multi-county area where they're gonna build a school. So we never, literally never know when the, where the school is gonna be built until they break ground and put a sign up. 
And that impacts us pretty heavily on the planning, uh, especially in our fast growing uh, areas. And so that is a real challenge for us, not just on an enrollment situation, but on a facilities planning uh, situation uh, as well. So I thought I'd, I'd bring that to your attention in case that's something that resonates with you. If you have not seen that in your community, um, and you think that could be coming because of the political environment in your community or in your state, uh, I would have serious conversations with folks who have lived through that for a period of time. Because what you think you know about long-range planning for your facilities and what, you, what the demographers are telling you gets absolutely flipped on its head. Once that switch is flipped, uh, things look very, very different uh, in your community. One of the other things I wanted to emphasize that I think we've had good experience with, which may be uh, old hat for you, is uh, in those buildings that were built in the 50s and the 60s, 70s, we've started going in and bringing in a consultant, an architect, to help us with a master plan of those facilities. We know that there are many of our older campuses that over time, we're gonna have to either renovate or completely reconstruct every building uh, on that site. And what we have had a tendency to do, and this may apply to you, is pick a building to start with because of various and sundry reasons, either foundation issues or capacity issues in the building. Um, and what we know is that we need to think about what that whole campus is gonna look like maybe 10 or 15 years down the line uh, while we're doing that current day uh, construction. So we've had some good experience with master planning those uh, older campuses that gives us a sense of what needs to be done next, what can be the, the third priority, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Another thing that I'll mention uh, that I think is really impacting uh, us, and I suspect you as well, is a growing desire for more flexible space as we uh, design and renovate uh, buildings. I think that started for us with uh, librarians coming to us and saying, bolted down stacks no longer work, right? That kids want more electronic materials and fewer paper books and having those stacks bolted to the ground uh, just doesn't work for us any longer. And so we've looked at redesigning uh, our library spaces and are starting to conceive of what they could look like on a campus-wide basis around having essentially everything in the space be flexible, such that it could be moved out of the way and a large meeting could happen in the space. It could be clustered together for a small group. We're having those conversations. And a lot of that, as you might imagine, has to do with flexible and modular furniture. One of the things that we did in this bond that just passed in May is we, we've traditionally gone back and renovated libraries, six, eight, 10 each bond issue. But we knew uh, that that's a really, in 120 schools, that's a pretty slow process. All of us will be long gone before we get them all done. So one of the things we did this time is we put a line item in there for flexible furniture for those uh, library type spaces. Enough money where we can go and not necessarily renovate the entire library, but we can pull the furniture out of the library and put the new, more flexible furniture, things that one person can move instead of three or four people having to move uh, so that they can get better use uh, out of that space. We see a lot of demand for that uh, in our schools these days. Um, and it's not something we want to just have at the newest schools, right? It's something we want to be able to provide those, those kids and staff uh, at our older schools uh, as well. Another thing that uh, is happening, and this, this may be uh, more particular to Texas, um, a few, several years ago, uh, Texas had a, a curriculum that essentially was assumed that every child was going straight to four-year university right out of high school, as if that were somehow actually going to happen, and that the curriculum would there, thus cause all the children to desire and be able to afford to go to college. Uh, it wasn't working well, as, imagine that. And so the state, uh, through a lot of effort, had a relook at career and technology uh, education and thought about, you know, if we provide kids some skills uh, in high school, they might be able to, one, go get a job after high school, and two, they might even be able to get a job that'll support them through some kind of higher education uh, environment. Imagine that logic. So, so we did that uh, in our state, uh, and we have had a, a renewed look at career and technology, and that's caused us internally to go and look at our facilities uh, and look at redesign 
and really to track better than we have in the past the courses that we're offering to the job market that actually exists and try to connect those things um, in, a better, in a better way. Um, we've had an interesting conversation uh, in the state lately uh, where the, the Education Association wants to do away with funding for cosmetology. Uh, and that has drawn the ire uh, of a lot of folks, but it's this conversation about what do you offer in those career and technology programs in high schools, and does it connect well uh, to the job market? Are kids earning a livable wage uh, in that job when they leave? And so we've been uh, putting a lot of time and effort into relooking at our career and technology programs, into looking at the magnet schools that we offer. We have, we have five magnet schools now. We're gonna add a magnet school this coming year that will look at um, law, both from the law enforcement standpoint as well as from the, the, court, the courtroom aspect of law. It'll be public administration and it'll be medical services for kids. Those are all uh, job markets that in Bear County folks uh, can get a good job at uh, and either have a career or at least start in that field and put themselves through some kind of additional education uh, as they go on. One of, the, one of the real challenges for us, as you might imagine, and this is probably true for you all uh, as well, is maintaining and renovating those facilities built in the 50s and 60s and having those kids and staff have access to the same kinds of facility options uh, for a school that was just built in the last year or two. That's a real, uh, a significant challenge for us. Um, and for us, uh, one of the unique things about our system is that it's also an equity issue. Our oldest schools also contain the kids that are the most disadvantaged. It's just the way the geography works. The newest schools have very few, uh, are much smaller percentage of economically disadvantaged kids. So we get into this real equity uh, issue uh, in our system. And I mentioned to you that the, the vast majority of the dollars in the bond issue that we just passed will go to try to correct some of those equity issues in those oldest uh, schools, but that is a real challenge uh, for us, and we try to keep up with that uh, on a regular, uh, on a constant basis. So let me just talk a, a little bit about, um, more specifically about construction-related challenges um, that we face, and I feel certain you're, you're in the same situation. Anybody worry about inflation at all? Yeah. Um, it's one of those things when you plan a, a bond expenditure, uh, for the 2018 bond that, that we just passed, we planned most of that work in late 2016 and, and early 2017, right? And some of the, that, that work won't finish until 2023. So you're six years later uh, finishing the work. And a lot of things can happen in six years. Natural disasters seem to occur at a regular pace uh, in our country these days. Um, and that and just general inflation really scares us with regard to, to future planning. Uh, on bond programming. You all know, I'm sure you face the same thing we do, and that is the labor market is really, really tight. Um, we really struggle, especially in our air, in, inside the school district, um, in transportation, and finding bus drivers, and custodians, and child nutrition folks. It's a really tight job market, and we know that translates uh, into the, the facilities construction area. Uh, as well, and that's certainly a challenge uh, for us. One of the things that we try to do, both when we're designing facilities for a bond issue that we're planning on building three or four or five years into the future, as well as when we're building the actual project, is we try to partner with our general contractors and our architects early and often uh, to try to get everybody on the same page around what are we designing, what is our budget, so that we don't go, so that we don't bust it, at least not too badly, uh, and then what is that finished product uh, gonna look like? So there's a lot of collaboration between those, the GC uh, and the school district, uh, and certainly the architect and the, uh, the other consultants uh, as well. The relationship among those folks is, uh, is a really interesting one. It's obviously, the consultants are working for the school district. We're clearly the owner, we're going to be the owner, we're gonna have the final say uh, in how much money gets spent and how it's designed and for that matter how it's constructed, right? We're clearly the owner. But we've gotta have a solid working relationship with those folks 
if that coordination is really going to happen. And so I think we do a, uh, an admirable job. Our staff does a, a really good job of being the owner and clearly the boss and running the project, but at the same time working with folks and understanding the challenges that we have. We've just had in Texas, which is very unusual, we, we have had 10 straight weeks of rain. And so uh, very unusual in, in, in this part of the world. And so we've got to work with those GCs who are really struggling on projects that aren't, uh, where they're not indoors yet, because they've got legitimate issues. And those are going to cause timeline issues, and we're going to have to work with them uh, in, order to get, in order to get what we want out of the project, but in order to also have a long-term relationship with that GC. If we treat them unreasonably, we can expect that same kind of treatment uh, as we come around. The, I mentioned uh, labor shortage um, and the, just the, the tight job market uh, that we have. Um, we certainly see that in our maintenance area uh, as well, um, where we really struggle to find some of those trade folks. Um, we've struggled so much in San Antonio to find folks in the plumbing, electrical, HVAC type fields that we actually opened a magnet school to deal with that. We have kids, high school kids, studying those fields at one of our uh, high schools because obviously not just us, but the entire area was really struggling with how do we meet those needs for those skilled trades. Um, and what we see is massive inflation in cost because that labor market is so tight uh, in those areas. So we actually opened a school several years ago to try to deal uh, with that. So let me talk a little bit about uh, something that I think is on our mind, and I know it's on your agenda uh, later today, and that is uh, school safety and how we deal with that. So as you well know, uh, we've had a lot of high-profile uh, tragedies in, in K-12 schools in the last uh, several years. Um, and when we think about safety, we think about it in, in three ways. We think about it with people and that looks like police officers and folks that kind of pay attention to our schools. And we think about it with procedures so that we train people on what to do and where to go and who to call and those kinds of things. And then obviously third, we think about it from a facilities design standpoint, from a hardening of schools uh, standpoint. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've done uh, and where we might be uh, going with regard to the facilities uh, part. So uh, before the most recent rash of school shootings, we had begun retrofitting our elementary schools. We, we actually stationed one of our police officers at every middle school and two police officers at every high school. So they're constantly uh, staffed with a law enforcement uh, professional. We don't have the staffing though to do that at our 79 elementary schools. So what we started to do is go back to those schools and add a, a ballistic security lobby uh, at every one of those campuses and then do access control work around the exterior of the building or buildings so that folks who aren't employed there are pretty much get pinched in through that main entrance where they have to be vetted in the security lobby and only after they're vetted are they allowed into either the school office area or the, the main campus. So we're, uh, with the bomb that just passed, we'll finish that project uh, at all 79 uh, of our elementary schools. As you might imagine, that is an expensive project, especially to retrofit uh, an older building. It's an expensive project when you have schools designed as multiple buildings, a pod-type structure that adds to the challenge uh, as well. There are other things, though, that, that we're in the process of doing that are uh, less expensive and not near as sexy, frankly, um, and that's things like going and looking at old door hardware and asking the simple question, can the teacher lock the door without having to go out into the corridor and actually do it, right? Um, and so there are things like that that we're in the process of that you may be uh, as well that, that will improve safety for those kids in that classroom without a huge, uh, without a tremendous cost. We are really struggling, as you may be as well, with the desire for what I mentioned earlier, open, flexible space, this kind of this general desire, lots of natural light, that's what folks want, balancing that with the need to have really secure campuses, right? And so we're really struggling with this conversation. As you might imagine, every time one of these incidents happens, we get a call from a group of parents that want that building locked down, right? 
They don't want, they want armed guards in front. They don't want anybody coming in that building during the school day, and I get it. I have a kid in school too. I absolutely understand that desire. But then as the issue fades, as the news cycle goes, you get the other group saying, that's not what I want for my kid, right? I want my kid to be in a place that feels safe, but also feels like a school and not a penitentiary, right? Anybody in this room could design a safe school where, where you virtually could guarantee kids' safety, but it would look like prison, wouldn't it? It would look like a place where metal detectors were at every door. It would look like a place with high fencing. It would look like a place with very little natural light. And so we're really struggling with, uh, in our conversations, about how do we balance the need for safety, physical safety, with this uh, desire for modern and new and open uh, type spaces. And I'm sure that, and, I, and I'm no expert on that, and I'm sure that you will hear from experts uh, in that topic uh, today. Um, and I can't wait for our folks to come back and give us the answer, right? Tell us the solution, we'll make it happen tomorrow, not a problem. So certainly safety um, is an issue that all of us are struggling with uh, as we try to improve it for our kids but not create a situation uh, that's really uh, not in keeping with the, the core mission of the building, which is to educate, right, which is to actually teach kids uh, some things, and that requires a supportive uh, environment. So let me just... Um, wrap with a couple of additional thoughts. And then if you have questions, I, I'd be happy to answer. I, I realize that uh, you're a little off this morning due to the cancellation of the, the other speaker. So um, one of the things I'll say uh, by way of appreciation is um, I don't think that the general public has uh, a, a sense or an appreciation for uh, the work that you do. So thanks to all of you who do the maintenance work that keeps kids safe and the building comfortable for teachers and, and kids. Thanks to all of you who are in fast growth districts who are really struggling with gotta build classrooms, gotta build classrooms, gotta fund classrooms, gotta find the money to build classrooms. Um, and thanks to those of you who are on the other end of that spectrum where you're not worried about new classrooms, you're worried about 60 and 80 and 100 year old buildings and how do you keep them up to date? How do you provide technology to kids and staff? that's really obviously in demand uh, these days. I think folks don't appreciate the work that happens uh, in the K-12 facility space, um, and we, uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, welcome to uh, San Antonio, and I hope you get a, a lot out of uh, this conference. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood. Excuse me, appreciate it. We do have a few moments now for Q&A if anybody in the audience has questions for Dr. Woods. So I just had a question on, you talked about the relationship with the general contractor and the architect. Um, has that changed? Like now you're saying it's very collaborative, um, more approaching them, approaching you as an owner. In the past, what was that like? No, I, I, I don't think it's changed um, fundamentally. I think we have had some, um, we've had some turnover internally within our system that has made that collaboration more successful, uh, frankly. Um, I, and I wanna, before I get down today and by way of answering your question, I wanna introduce our assistant superintendent for facilities and that's Leroy San Miguel. He's got a presentation actually uh, later uh, today, but there's a, there's a real balance, right, between being an owner, which sometimes means you have to say you're not doing it right, and having a long-term relationship with these folks so that you feel like you're getting good service you know, going forward. Um, and Leroy and his staff have really been able to balance that well, I think, um, and work with the GC, but at the same time be the owner and say, that's unacceptable. You know, we're, we're not gonna have it. You know, you're gonna have to go back and redo that. And that, you know, that happens on occasion. So it happens, but, Generally, we keep that relationship with the contractor, which, which I think is important. We, we have a tendency, and our board prioritizes doing business with local folks. They prioritize doing business with folks that they have some kind of relationship with, some kind of knowledge of. Um, and so having the staff have that kind of constructive relationship is really important. Right.
Yeah, yeah, I, it's a good comment. And that's a that's a real. Um, I think that's a real challenge, and I th I see it from the contractor's view, especially in a really tight labor market like the one that we have now. Um, you know, one of the things that on really large projects, one of the, one of the projects we have in this bond that just passed, is a is a high school, 430, 440,000 square feet. Um, and so you're looking at that general contractor and asking them to give a guaranteed maximum price a long time before that building actually gets finished with a lot of uncertainty about their own labor situations. So that's, that's, a tough, that's a tough circumstance for, for us and for them. Can you elaborate a little more on the magnet school that you opened up and kind of at what point in school they would enroll in something like that and how you set that up, just the process? Sure, so uh, by way of context, we've been doing magnet high schools uh, for about 30 years, so we've got some experience uh, in that. I mentioned that we have a, a construction magnet that has both a trade side as well as an architect and engineer side of the, of the house. We've got a medical services magnet. We have a magnet that's focused on entrepreneurship and cybersecurity. Um, just kind of give you a sense uh, of what those schools look like. So what we do is we go out at the end of kids' seventh grade year with us and just kind of give them high level. These are our magnet programs. Um, then at the middle of their eighth grade year, they, they express a desire to go to one or more uh, of those magnet programs. The magnet that I mentioned that we're getting ready uh, to open, we don't have a physical facility for it yet. We have the dollars to build it, but we haven't had a chance to get that done. So we'll actually begin that with a class of freshmen in 1920, um, and we'll put them in portables. We've already hired a principal. We've got a curriculum ready. We'll put them in portables for a couple of years before we have a building uh, for them. With one exception, our magnet schools sit on a campus of a comprehensive high school. So those kids have magnet type curriculum, but they also go out to the regular high school. So in the example I gave you with public administration and law and medical services, they'll go out and take math with the, the rest of the kids at the high school, right? They'll eat lunch with the rest of the kids at the high school. If they wanna participate in fine arts or athletics, that's an option for them at that site high school. Uh, and then they come into this building to take their specialized uh, curriculum. We have one exception to that. The, the health-focused uh, magnet is in our medical center here in San Antonio so that those kids can go and intern in the hospitals and in the clinics that are right there and surround it. So it's a standalone, but it serves a lot of challenges. Those kids don't have access to those fine arts and extracurricular offerings that a, that a kid at a 3,000 student high school would have access to. So that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and the kids and families have to understand that, you know, when they make that, that choice. Our magnet schools have about four applications for every spot that they have. They're, they're very popular programming. Um, it kind of goes back to the comment I made to you about charter schools in the, in the generation in which we live, and just looking at the audience, there's a few of you that are in this generation, not maybe a whole lot, um, that they grew up in a Starbucks world, right? They grew up in an iPad world. And if I can't have my coffee any one of 470,000 ways, I'm not comfortable, right? I've gotta have choice in everything, and I need Amazon to you know, drone deliver me something in an hour. That's the world in which they live. And so this notion of choice in our systems is really important. We're in, always engaged in this conversation about how do we give more choice within our system? How do we give more choice, more choice, more choice? Because that attitude that we all had where there wasn't any question about where you were gonna to go to school, that's gone. Those days are over. At least in big urban areas in most states, those days are done. So magnet programming becomes pretty important. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so each of them has a little bit of a different story. Um, the first one, the original one, was a health, the health careers magnet. And it was just simply the, the medical foundation in the city saying, we want you guys to open a school where we can start moving kids into that job field. Then you've got the one that I mentioned about construction trades. That was purely the, our contractors who build our schools coming to us and saying, we are getting killed in the labor market. What can you do to help us? That kind of thing. So each of them has a little bit of a different 
uh, story. The one that we're going to open uh, next year is really about us studying the local job market and saying where are there jobs for kids that we don't that we're not doing as good a job as we can to help prepare kids. So we cobbled together that curriculum just to meet the the job needs in the community. Yes, sir. Uh, you guys have been building for quite some time. How's the relationship between the building uh, industry, um, you all as administrators, and your teachers and your students? Do the teachers and students feel like the process is working, the facilities that we're creating for them is working? How's that relationship going? That's a, that's a great question. So I've talked a lot about the relationship between the contracting community and the, and the school district, the administrators. I haven't talked very much about how does that impact teachers and kids. Um, and so what I'll tell you is, when we were growing 2,800 or 3,000 kids a year, we did very little, I'll, full transparency, communication with how, how our designs were impacting teachers and kids. We were in such a rush to just get buildings on the ground that we probably did not do that enough. Since our growth has slowed, we've gotten a lot better in that. So when we, I mentioned master planning and trying to look at it at a facility 15 or 20 years into the future, we've brought staff in to those master plans, had conversations with people who have worked on those campuses for a long time. We've debated this safety versus open concept with staff um, and parents and kids for that matter. So, so I think we've done a better job once we, our growth slowed, we felt like we could breathe a little a little better, but I'll say if I regret anything in the way that we designed 10 years ago, it was that we probably weren't getting enough uh, input. The decisions were being made at the administrator, contractor, board level, you know, really purely. Um, and we would do programming reviews, like, you know, before we design a new high school, we'd go to the science people and say, tell us what you think about science labs these days. But we really weren't down at the, at the grassroots level having conversations with kids and teachers. Um, and we're better about that uh, now. Um, that's a lesson learned for us, I think. Thank you for your comments today. Um, how are you guys marrying magnet programs and CT programs as you're doing your master plan? Um, so that's a, it's a good question. Most of our magnet schools have a deep CTE uh, influence in them. Um, uh, and more so all the time since the passage of that legislation I mentioned uh, earlier. We have uh, one, one campus that's kind of a, a journalism communications type campus that doesn't have as deep a CTE uh, interaction, but all of the others do. Um, we've gone in the last, say, five years from about 15,000 kids enrolled in CTE to almost 30,000 kids enrolled in CTE. Um, and, and some of that is at our magnet uh, schools. When a kid leaves one of our magnet schools, other than that one exception I mentioned, they've got four or five or six CTE courses that they've taken, and all of them graduate with what we in Texas call a, a coherent sequence, you know, a, a stacked series of CTE courses all, that are aligned. Um, and so that's something that we've really worked towards and are, and are proud of. One of the things that I think all of you probably realize about CTE is, was that there was a time when kids were either four year, straight to four-year college type kids or they were CTE kids, right? And there wasn't a lot of movement across that boundary. That's not the case at all. Where we've got now four years, kids that are clearly headed to four-year university enrolled in forensic science and anatomy and physiology and really rigorous CTE uh, courses. Um, and so we're proud of that transition we've made over time. Um, but it's, we are in the process of, we've had a, we've worked with an architect who's reviewed all of our CTE facilities, um, and man, have we got a lot of work to do. Oh my gosh. I don't even want to think about what the bond issue is going to cost for that, you know, those projects. Um, that may be the next superintendent's problem, frankly. That, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? I said you, uh, you mentioned online courses. Yeah. I said, has Northside ventured into, into that? Um, so one thing I'll say, uh, as I have the opportunity, is Oscar here is in Fort Bend ISD, and they just passed it last week a $950 million bond. Um, so he's got a little work to do. Um, so his question is about online courses. 
we have done a little bit of online courses using other folks' work. Um, there are ways in our state where kids can access online courses and still be enrolled uh, with the school district. Um, I'll tell you that what we found is generally not a quality that we're very happy with, frankly. Um, typically, the kids we've got doing online coursework have already taken a course in one of our schools, were not successful, and now they're having a redo uh, experience. Um, we've had a conversation about creating our own, and thus we could control the quality. Uh, we just haven't gotten uh, down that road yet. So, so the kids that we've got doing online are really doing it through some other a vendor or another school district's uh, creation. Any other questions? Dr. Brian Woods, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it for that very insightful and thorough presentation.